Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 88, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. It does actually feel a little bit weird because we're in the studio during the day. It's bright. What's going on? <laughs> it's usually dark outside. Yeah, normally we do the show like on a weekday evening. Today, though, it's a Saturday afternoon, glorious sunshine outside. And let's be fair, for us to completely change up our routine, it had to be for a very special reason. Oh, and this is for a very, very special guest. We've got Ian Livingston, OBE, and this guy is just amazing. All the kind of geek things that I did when I was a kid are down to him. Games Workshop, I spent a lot of time in their store kind of playing with miniatures and painting stuff. And also, you know, I've spent a lot of time playing with Lara Croft and <laughs> <laughs> still kind of do. <laughs> She's still your obsession today, oh, Ravi. Totally. Everybody knows it. Ian Livingston, OBE. Now, Ian's actually, so we record this show in Nottingham, and um, obviously Games Workshop, you know, headquarters here in Nottingham. Yeah, he's patron of the National Video Game Arcade as well, so he's very involved with those guys. Yeah, and he's actually in town today, so he's going to be coming in the studio to do this live with us, not over the phone, not on Skype, nothing like that, so... Yeah, he's doing a little uh, story smash writing kind of gameplay event at the moment at the local libraries, which yeah. is cool, because he's into his adventure games and all of that. Well, you know, this is going to be one for... You know, every guest that we talk to who's got a history of, like, adventure games, they all started with, like, D&D &D and, you know... Tabletop gaming and stuff like that, yeah. And yeah. then and then computers came around and they're like, oh, we can make this digital, yeah. you know? So this is going to be such an interesting one. Definitely hang around for it. Ian Livingston is this week's special guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, of course, we couldn't come in and do this show every week without the people who find it in their hearts to make a little donation into the running of the Retro Hour podcast every week. Now, we do have a little tip jar on our website. And the thing about it is, I mean, it, it's not a, it doesn't have to be a recurring donation. It doesn't, it's not a patron. It's nothing like that. Not a crowdfunder. It is literally a tip jar where you can put a couple of quid in, a couple of euros, a couple of dollars, and it all goes back into the running of this show and lets us come in here and do this every week. Yeah, it's just like a little pot. And we can also do... Bitcoin donations as well, so many currencies. We yeah, PayPal, Bitcoin, yeah. you find all those links on the front page of our website, theretrohour.com. And then, if you do make a donation, you find your way into the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Da, da, da. Very prestigious. Yeah. Now, this week, we want to say thank you so much to Stefan Ricken, Clive Glazebrook, Steve Engeldow, and Benny Damsgaard-Nielsen. Who all made donations into the running of the Retro Hour podcast. Thank you so much. Really does mean the world to us. And you can do the same. All you've got to do is head to our website, theretrohour.com. Now, let's get into this week's news stories. This is pretty amazing. Were you a fan of Resident Evil back in the day? Oh, I absolutely love Resident Evil. It, that and Silent Hill were the games that really got me scared. Actually, Dark Seed got me incredibly scared before that. Yeah. But kind of, you know, for zombies, this one was really good. I think for me, it was Alone in the Dark and then Resident Evil that were the two games that really, you know, the first kind of proper horror games. Yeah, and you're just like, oh. My brother had it, you know, he did PlayStation 1 and we'd sit there with like the lights off, you know, playing it at like 10, 11 at night and, you know, you'd walk around the corner and like, a lot of jumps in that game, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Well, obviously back then though, I mean, Resident Evil was kind of a system seller for the PlayStation. You know, a lot of people moved away from like Snares and Mega Drive, bought a PlayStation just to play that game. Yeah, and they also had some uh, good Saturn games yeah. as well for Resi. Well, it turns out you didn't actually have to do that. You know, if you'd have just waited 25 <laughs> years. <laughs> Resident Evil arrives on the Mega Drive. Well, this is a... a Kind of a demake, but I'd say this is totally different to a demake because they haven't done like if they do a demake, they do stuff like take the textures down, get it slower, make it wireframe. Yeah. This one they've turned it into a cartoon style. Yeah. Basically. So I don't know, it's a cartoon make. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is kind of I mean, yeah, it's an entirely different like style of game, really, I guess, yeah. isn't it? It's an isometric game. Um it kind of, you know, I think what they've done with it, it's only a proof of concept, really, at the moment, by the looks of it. It's a little demo that's made by a team of Russian homebrew coders. They're called PSCD. And this is a downloadable demo at the moment. And it kind of takes, you know, a lot of the familiar elements of the first game. But there's also things like, you know, Claire Redfield, who was in Resident Evil 2. Yeah. She's like the character that you play in this. So and the, and the thing is, as well, it, the look of it, it looks very like a the kind of menu selection on it. It looks like a Final Fantasy RPG hmm. or a kind of, JRPG. It's, it's got that look. And I, I don't know if you've seen the video of it because I've just linked the story to this, Dan. But okay. um, the animations and the characters, they haven't got them walking yet. 
Yeah, so they slide. They slide, yeah, exactly. They slide across. And then when they just shoot the zombie, the zombie just disappears. It doesn't fall over or anything yet. But it's really cool, though. It's got the essential ideas of Resident Evil in there. Yeah, all the groundwork's been done by the looks of it. I mean, they only started this eight weeks ago, so... Yeah, they must be big fans. And, you know, I think with these kind of graphics, they may be able to get it onto a cart. Yeah. Which would be really cool. Do you ever remember the um, version of Resident Evil for the Amiga? I remember hearing about it. I don't think I ever played it, though. It was like just a set of slideshows. Right. But you know when you went, you played Resi anyway, when you go between the places, there'd be those doors that would open and you go, yeah, like that, and all those different noises. It had those sound effects in. So it's quite cool. And you just kind of click on different parts of the screen. Uh, anybody that wants to play that is on the Aminet, and it's it's pretty hilarious, yeah. I remember back in, you know, around that era... Um, because, you know, obviously the Amiga didn't get a lot of those games and people did try and, you know, do, like, ports and stuff. Yeah, like slideshows and Well, stuff funny like enough, that. I was looking at, like, the first Amiga FPS. It was one called Poom. Do you remember Poom? Yeah, yeah. Poom, yeah. yeah I was, was chatting to Gaz Murphy, like, you know, listen to our show. He's been, he did, like, you know, Gloom, uh, the zombie edition yeah, um, yeah. on the Amiga. We're chatting about that the other night, just FPSs, and, yeah, I looked at that Poom demo again. I remember my jaw dropped when I saw that back in the day. Yeah, so. it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you didn't realise it. Like the walls weren't, re- the floors weren't rendered. Yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of little <laughs> tricks on that. But it is cool when you see something that you thought was previously impossible. So it's, um, you know, I hope they progress with this, um, you know, Resident Evil port to the Mega Drive. I yeah, think. I like it. It's like that old isometric style, isn't it? Yeah, and if you want to play it, there is actually a downloadable demo. Uh, all you've got to do is nip onto our website, theretrohour.com. You'll find it in this week's show notes. Now, speaking of the Amiga, did you see that eBay auction? I did. I saw the big eBay auction and I thought, bloody hell, this is going to be fake, hasn't it? Because <laughs> um, it was for a pre-production Amiga uh, development system. Basically, this is like, you know, when you have your Apple IIs that are made out of wood yeah. that, that was hand-built. This is kind of like a hand-built one. And I guess it got s- sent out to other companies and, uh, you know... The companies that would start using Amigas. Yeah, I think it was like um, Cinemaware, obviously, when they were doing uh, Defender of the Crown and um, Electronic Arts when they're doing D-Paint, you know, the original version. So it's kind of, I mean, looking at the era that this came out, it was um, a pre-production unit, so before the Amiga was launched. So you're talking like 83, 84, I imagine. Um, And it's just a black box, really, with, you know, there's connectors and everything on there. It's got a weird keyboard as well that looks a bit like, um, you know, the first Amiga, the A1000. Yeah. It's a bit like that, but the keys are kind of laid out a bit different on it, aren't they? And it's got a really old logo as well. That weird A logo. Yeah. That looks like kind of Twin Peaks. (laughs) (laughs) And it's probably got space for like, you know, one of the bigger floppy disk drives, you know, 5.25 inch drive. And the whole thing's made out of thick black metal steel. But the main interesting thing about this is uh, the kind of price that it sold for. What would you thought this would have go for? I I thought this was going to go for maybe like, you know, Five grand, I thought. Yeah, five or six, because, you know, who's going to (laughs) pay more than that for it? We don't know if it works. Yeah, other than a museum. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, and it hasn't been turned on. Well, it went for £16,100. Wow, that's that's fantastic. (laughs) That's... uh... Yeah, for the seller. Yeah. <laughs> he, he must have had his socks blown off, you know. It's crazy, isn't it, what kind of prices? But, I mean, I don't know who did buy it in the end. I yeah. imagine it's, you know, hopefully it is like someone like a museum who's going to display it or someone who's maybe going to restore it. Because there are like early edition um, ROMs and stuff on here as well. That oh, done cool. So. so if they could rip the ROMs or, yeah, that that could be really interesting, actually. Yeah. So Just kind of deconstruct them. Do you think this one says guru on it or software failure? Uh, That's think, the question. Yeah, yeah who, who knows? Um, but yeah, you could be running it on UAE you know, in the next few months if yeah, <laughs> someone yeah, has dumped their arms. So if, if you are the person who bought it, you know, please do get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you. Totally. What made you pay 16 grand for <laughs> an Amiga prototype? Now, this is quite an interesting list in the Metro this week. Five games that need the Sonic Mania treatment. So by Sonic Mania treatment, my kind of guess of what the Metro thinks Sonic Mania treatment is, is making it still 2D, Yeah, but really fat with new graphics, HD, and all of that stuff. And it's cool that, you know, because we were talking last week on the show, weren't we, about the fact that everything in like the mid to late 90s had to be 3D and no one was releasing 2D games that couldn't get commissioned yeah, anywhere. Yeah. Um, and it's cool that 2D, especially this kind of retro-looking 2D, it seems to be really in vogue again now. Yeah, totally. And like that, that, that was the whole idea of the Saturn, wasn't it? That it was going to be the perfect 2D console. 
But then they kind of went, ah, 3D's coming. All right, abandon all the 2D yeah. stuff. And, Shove uh, some more chips in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this list, um, I actually agree with most of these, to be fair. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of them would benefit from kind of just nice little subtle upgrades and like mm. new games built around them. Now, the first one they mention is Rainbow Islands, which, I mean, I was a huge fan of that. I used to play that at the you know seaside arcades when I was a kid. I love the music on that game as well. And obviously we had Bubble Bobble. And Parasol Stars. If you remember yeah, that I, I, I remember Rainbow Island and stuff. Yeah, they, they were quite nice games, actually. And there was so many ports for absolutely everything. It's like Spectrum Rainbow Islands, wasn't yeah. it? Well, that was the first one I played, actually, yeah. I think. My, my friend, um, Martin, he had a Spectrum pretty late on, though, about 91, 92, slightly Spectrum. And I went over there and we were playing games one night. And actually, I do remember Rainbow Islands really sticking in my memory and being yeah. like, oh, actually, Spectrum's you know, a lot better than I previously thought it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it would be great to see an upgraded version of Rainbow Islands because I think, again, I mean, probably only for, I imagine, the European market. And I think it's kind of a game that probably was quite big in Japan in the arcades. Yeah, the yeah, because it. it's got that like bubble bobbly kind of Namco feel. You yeah, know? Well, same characters, I think, isn't it? Bubble yeah. and Bob, they're called, or you know, maybe not, but it's that, that same style. Um, but yeah, I, I think it could be, it is a game that's very well respected. Mm. A lot of people class it as, like, you know, their favourite game of all time. I'm not sure how big it was in America, though. No, no, me neither. Yeah, so it would be interesting to know. But, yeah, it'd be cool to bring back, I think. It could sell really well. This one, when I looked at it, I was a bit like, hmm, because it has had a few upgrades over the years and they've been awful. Golden Axe. Yeah, Golden Axe. Didn't it Didn't it have some 3D upgrades? Well, like a PS2 or something that came out, and didn't it? I remember so, it being so really So maybe bad. the 2D... Sonic Mania treatment might actually suit that, you yeah. know, because Golden Axe is just classic. But the thing is, I I don't know. It's like, it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't feel the need for any more Golden Axe. Just stick with the original. It's so good. Yeah, it's even, <laughs> right. even, even like the later ones and that, you know, when I'm playing number two or three, I'm always like, I'd rather play the original again. Yeah, the first yeah. One. It's like Streets of Rage. I'd love to have a remake or a, a, a kind of different one, but I don't know if they, if they redid Streets of Rage one or two with Sonic Mania kind of just nicer features. I don't know if I'd like it. Yeah, you might be like, well, I've got the original anyway, let's just play the first one. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, especially with these games, I mean, you can get Golden Axe, obviously, on like, you know, Xbox Live or PSN. I mean, you can download them in the arcade. And that's the thing with this, like, Sonic Mania treatment. It mm. is essentially, you know, Sonic Mania, you, you do Green Hill Zone, you do the kind of original game, but then there's additional features in yeah. there. So, yeah. I think maybe if you did Golden Axe and, uh, you know, it was like the original one, um, but maybe some like cool effects and stuff, and some. So that's the thing with Sonic Mania; it's all the twists in it you get, and you're like, "Oh wow!" You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah. Imagine if you could get like different uh, reptiles or animals to go on and stuff. That'd be cool. And the magic was always great, wasn't it? On... I just like beating those little guys up that gave money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you're at the campfire. Ow, ow. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> just the whole game of that would be great. <laughs> no, I always found really unfair about um, about Golden Axe. You get some characters, and to get their magic, you only need like four of the little blue things. Yeah. some of them need like about ten. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's not fair, you know what I mean? But they do some really cool ones. Remember, you know, if you played the, the female character, you get like a big fire dragon to come down and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, and... there was loads of stuff and like rings of fire and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's such a good game and it's like, it's maybe want to play the original again now, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'd definitely buy it if they did do like a, a new game based on the original characters and design. Totally. I guess. Uh, the next one on the list is Ghouls and Ghosts. Sadly, I could say I've never played it, which... Yeah, everyone's going to be like, no, what are you doing? I hear it's classic. It is. Um, very tough. Mm. Very hard game. And again, it was another one I used to play in like, the Seaside Arcades. I my friend Sean had it on um, Commodore 64 as well. And, you know, it, it, it was a very unforgiving game. Generally considered one of the hardest games of the era. But again, it's, it's a game that's very well respected. It's got a lot of fans. You know, a lot of people do have very fond memories of it. I think, I, w I wonder if they did do a new version of it, whether the, the difficulty will be toned down a bit. Yeah. So, next one on the list, Joust. That was a very early arcade game. Yeah, and uh, the main kind of theme for uh, Ready Player One. Yeah. The final kind of battle. So I reckon that Joust would get massive interest from the public once uh, that film comes out. Well, you look at Joust, and obviously, like like a lot of these early games. I mean, this came out in 1982, the original yeah. game, was a Williams Arcade. And <laughs> the theme is like, you know, you fight on flying ostriches, which is a bit <laughs> yeah. random. That's, that's, a bit, that's a bit like Jeff Mitchell, isn't it? It's not traditional yeah. medieval uh, <laughs> joust, is it? I think no. it's a simple game, though, but it's just loads of fun. Yeah. Which, yeah. again, I mean, it's like, I remember a game I used to have on the, um, the Commodore Plus 4, 
And it was called, um, it came, you remember you used to get those game packs where you get like the budget games, like four or five on like yeah, on disc yeah. or tape. And it was, it was in one of those. It was on like the B side. And I think it was called Quick Draw. And literally all it was, it was like even black and white graphics, really lazy. And you had like, it looked a bit like Pong, black screen with a line down the middle. And you had two, basically the Pong paddles were just like cowboys though. And you'd shoot each other. So you know in Pong, oh, you've got cool. to bounce a ball back. That's a good idea. It'd be yeah. the, first, the quickest one to shoot the other person. Quick draw, yeah. Yeah, like, like, you've got yeah. to press a five button as soon as a countdown comes on. And again, really simplistic game. But we'd play it for like hours and hours. Oh, just one more go, one more go. So it's the kind of thing you look at. And it, you know, if I saw that at like Xbox Live, I'd be like, I'm not buying that. Actually, maybe I'll give it a go. Oh, they've it. remade it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remake quick on the draw, whatever it was called. Uh, and finally on this list, I think, you know, many people regard this as probably the best shoot 'em up game ever. Our type. Yeah, totally. I, I totally agree that there should be a good remake. But also, I think there has been. Yeah. They've just been under different names. Mm. And it's just not had the R-Type name, but loads of people have remade them. Even even into the few, like later stuff on Amiga and PC, there was a lot of kind of shmups. Yeah, side-scrolling shooting. Yeah, they yeah. were all themed on R-Type and the kind of ideas that came with it initially. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, I think for a lot of these, it's kind of having the original brands come back is also part of the appeal as well I guess isn't it you know having a new R-type game yeah but then you know like we said you know like this list is if they did the Sonic Mania kind of treatment I think that's going to get more fans than doing something like this you know ultra HD graphics and upgraded because a lot of the time people look at it they just don't tie with your memories do they and people automatically dislike them so it would definitely be cool if you know it's kind of started a bit of a trend now this is a genre I was never into really uh, apart from <laughs> one game I used to have. Now, we're talking here about um, football management games. Ah, yes, because the NVA, National Video Game Arcade in Nottingham, are holding a new exhibition. Remember that last one was the um, Dizzy Twins one? Oliver Twins, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they're, they're basically going through the kind of history of British gaming and great greats that were in it, basically. And this is the Collier Brothers mm -hmm. who did uh, Football Manager. A Football Manager is a unique game, Dan. Uh, first, talk about your one that you, that you had, your experiences, because I know this genre is not your strength, is it? No, well, we, uh, we were Googling it before. What was the one I used to play called? Super League Manager. Super League Manager, that was it. And I think I got that on a cover disc. Yeah. So I remember, you know, back then I didn't have the internet or anything like that. So you play all the games that you got on cover tapes and cover discs and that kind of thing. Yeah, and this one, I don't know if you remember it, um, it wasn't a Mika game. And <laughs> you got the manager's desk. But you you put the mouse pointer over the cup of coffee, you click it, you go... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, go yeah. And, and the plant, you go... Blup, blup, blup. Yeah, you get your little watering can <laughs> yeah. out, wouldn't you? And then your phone would ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you'd have to keep doing all this stuff all the way till match day. Yeah. And then you'd be like, ah, and then you'd lose the match. And you'd have to try and buy and sell. Totally. Yeah. I had no idea what I was doing with most of the game. <laughs> Shuffle the papers around and answer the phone. I actually found that quite fun, though. But when it, it got, you know, the more advanced games, it was all statistics and you know, I know nothing but, about football. Yeah, it was really strange because Football Manager kind of, it was one of the most advanced ones, but it it kind of ignored the football. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, you get to the point that there was a match and it would be a text description on the screen. Mm. So this is like, you know, my mates would be using... Windows 98, yeah, playing it. So, you know, you think of the other games that are on there. It's not going to be text, but this game was so addictive. You know, you'd be sitting there and it would write a description like, I, I don't know, Gascoigne kicks from the left corner. It's going in near the penalty box. Mm. It flies across. And then it would, it would kind of describe it like that. And it, it was really exciting. And I remember my friend, basically, I used to go around his house nearly every weekend and he'd be sat there in his pants, just <laughs> hitting the space bar, playing. I haven't left the house for five yeah. days. <laughs> and I'd have to drag him out and go, come on, let's go meet some girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, it started as um, Championship Manager, wasn't it? That yeah, was, yeah. On the, it was a Sega game. Is Sega still produce it? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Okay. I think I think there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of football manager, championship manager. There was there was two brands going at the different time, and they yeah. were competing. So I, I, my memory's a bit shady on this one but, yeah sports uh, interactive it says in here Se sega europe are the publishers so i mean you know i think maybe that was a lot later on like when they started it must have been um just those guys <laughs> you know because it was it, it felt like a bit of a pd game at the beginning okay you know? yeah oh yeah championship manager was the original then it got renamed yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so. interesting but i mean again it, even though i know nothing about football and you know i've never even played 
championship manager or you know football manager it's a, it obviously a franchise that's still going now i mean i'm looking here the new game's coming out on november 10th yeah and and, and like like the dizzy game as well this was made by two brothers so yeah. uh, it's kind of got that unique you know feeling of it it's really good and the main the main thing about it is the kind of gameplay drives it rather than the graphics rather yeah. than any of the other stuff you know that comes secondary well they're doing this exhibition apparently there's going to be like rare works of art in there as well uh, things that you've probably never seen from it before from the development so well it's just opened yeah. hasn't it as well so that's going to be on for quite a long time so feel free to pop down to the mva and get your football manager on yeah well, i love the name of it as well football manager the beautiful exhibition oh nice yeah it's a beautiful <laughs> game <laughs> Now, before we get into this week's special guest, Ian Livingston, I thought this was pretty neat. This story got submitted by Phil H. He sent this to our website. A product that lets you use an Atari Jaguar controller on your PC. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to do that? <laughs> never. <laughs> no. The thing is, I've never used a Jaguar controller. I've always seen them and I've always heard people dissing them, but I'm not going to troll it or flame it because I... I've never touched one. I've never kind of no to feel you own a Jaguar, so yeah. you must know this. Well, yeah, I've, got, I've actually got three controllers for the Jag. I don't know why. There are two controller ports on it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're actually not bad. I mean, yeah, again, it's like you look on YouTube and stuff like that, and they are a controller that many people slag off or. You know, I think it's that like phone dial section at the bottom that that's what throws people. You know, the D pad on it looks quite nice, yeah. and the other buttons, you know. Yeah, I mean, that was quite a bad idea, I guess. In, in hindsight, it kind of threw it back to the early 80s, really, didn't it? Mm. But it was, um, you know, you get the little overlays in there as well for games. You put in, you know, over the number pad. I guess it might be good for PC gaming now. Yeah. Because you have so many commands. If, if you had GTA V, you could have a little overlay <laughs> on there. Enter, enter vehicle, <laughs> select weapon. Yeah. How come this guy's so good yeah. on GTA V? What's he using? <laughs> that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah. If that was like, the, the best controller for GTA Yeah, 5. totally optimised. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the reason for this, and I mean, it's on a website called um, refnet-tech.com. I'll put this in our show notes as well. They actually do adapters um, that essentially you plug into a modern PC via USB. It's got a little interface there as well, and they do these for, um, you know, Dreamcast, GameCube, Mega Drive, NES. Oh, so is this unique to the um, Jaguar or have they got other versions? Because I see it's the DB9 connector on the ends. The, uh... Yeah, well, the, the Jag controller port is actually, it's got more pins. It's like a like a VGA connector, actually. I think. Oh, wow. It's actually pin compatible with VGA. And the Atari STE, the enhancer model, had those ports on the side. Ah, Bizarrely, because they were the ones that no one ever used, and the actual joysticks were underneath on the Atari ST, and I could pull it out every time. But I think, you know, the reason they do all of these different interfaces, because, you know, you've got, you've got to buy a different one for each um, type of controller, but it's really to use it on emulators, mm. which, you know, it, that makes a lot of sense, really. Yeah, totally, totally. I'm just thinking of mad uses, <laughs> like, you know... But I think, you know, if you're going to play Alien vs. Predator or, you know... It, it, or just a drum machine. You know, <laughs> using a Tori Jaguar controller, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I think playing those games, because the word designed for those controllers, and often you look back, you know, I use emulators now and then, but using the keyboard, it's like the games that are designed for pads or sticks. Also, they're quite, you know, can get very expensive. Mm. So maybe emulating, and I, I don't know what the um, Jag emulator scene is like, yeah. but... Um, you know, emulating might save you a bit of money compared to getting the original hardware, especially with some of those Jaguar CD ones. Oh, it's like you know, Jaguar CDs, impossible to find, you know. You've got to be... I've, I've got one. I got really lucky, actually, because I had a Jaguar, and then there was a guy in Ami Bay, actually, was selling a Jaguar and the CD, and a, that's probably why I've got three controllers, actually, because I had a Jag before, um, for like 300 quid. Wow. And it had a few games included as well. So as soon as that came up, I snapped his arm up. I was like, I love that. So when you look on eBay now, I mean, you know, when they do come up, often the, the Jag CDs go for about four and 500 quid on their own. Well, I've got a very interesting thing to mention as well, which mm. is uh, I posted a picture earlier of me at Parallel Universe in Nottingham. Yeah. Which is a, a kind of small, small gaming shop. At the moment, he says, it resembles a car boot sale. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's just literally rammed full of games but there's some interesting news there actually um they've just moved from victoria center and they moved to mansfield road if you're in nottingham but what he's told me is they've got a whole floor underneath and he's currently doing that up and in october they're going to launch as half retro games half comic book store he told me he's got cdis 
down there. He's got, you know, Jaguars. Oh, okay. He's got Jag CD. He's got quite a few old school items. So, yeah, that's going to be really interesting and we'll keep an eye on that and uh, keep you updated. You know, last week you were saying that there's no gaming shops in London. We actually yeah. had a couple of messages saying there is. So. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what we needed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's two in Croydon, apparently. Oh, Croydon. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm trying to find... It's I can't quite, find... not quite central, is it, though? Yeah, a bit, a bit out of London. Yeah. I remember, actually, I went for my, my 30th birthday red night out, and like my mate booked the hotels and everything. And like, it was staying in Croydon, like an hour taxi journey after a night out. It was the like, last thing I wanted to do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, if you've got any favourite retro gaming shops as well, because, you know, we, we do get around the country. You know, it's always cool if you've got any suggestions. I think it's good to give them some love on the show as well. So, if you know, if you've got a favourite retro gaming shop, if it's nearby, we'll go and check it out or just give it a mention on the show. Uh, email us, show at theretrohour.com. Right then, well, thank you for checking out episode number 88 of the Retro Hour podcast. Of course, please do keep your reviews and your little five-star ratings and all that going on on iTunes. It all helps. Totally. Yeah, get us in the iTunes chart. That's always valuable. And uh, we'll be out again next Friday, available from all of your favorite podcast clients, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and of course on the website, theretrohour.com. Right then, are you ready for our special guest who's going to be in the studio? Ian Livingston, OBE, is this week's special guest. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome this week's very special guest. Not on the phone, not on Skype, not on Google Hangouts. Joining us in the studio, welcome to the Retro Hour, Ian Livingston. It's great to be here. Hello. Yeah, really appreciate you coming in. It's always nice to, you know, chat face to face rather than using technology. Well, I've got, it's great to be in Nottingham. I've obviously got a great affection for, for Nottingham from when Games Workshop. We moved it here, and of course, uh, I'm associated with the National Video Games Arcade, so good reason we'd be here as well, of course, talking on your show. Absolutely. Well, let's get back to those early days um, and go way back in the day. This is a question that we always like to start our interviews with, and it gets the the old grey matter working, I think. Um, What was your first ever experience with a computer then? Well, if you're talking about games, I say kind of not a processing computer game that processes information, but as a as a games console, I used to enjoy playing games on an Intellivision, uh, games like uh, uh, baseball and um, and you uh, what else? There was, anyway, there was there's loads of games. I mean, obviously the graphics are super simple, but then I bought a Pet, a Commodore Pet, and. Uh, played some of those glorious games in 8K of memory. <laughs> Loading off cassette tape, was it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the, but my, my machine, early machine of choice was the, an Amiga. Yeah. And I had learned to love the Amiga. Well, you're in good company here. <laughs> so were you always kind of interested in uh, reading and fantasy as a child? I used to read loads of comics, and I used to enjoy reading lots of science fiction books and, of course, fantasy books. I mean, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is a given, but uh, science fiction really kind of got my imagination rolling. And But I consumed tons of, of, of comics, and uh, I've always been a games player. So as long as I can remember, I've been enjoying playing games, so Wars of the Imagination has always been my place. Well, let's talk about Games Workshop. Obviously, you know, legendary company. You can't walk down a high street anywhere now without seeing a Games Workshop. Um, but you founded it here in Nottingham with your flatmates. No, I actually found it in London. Okay. In 1975. Right. Before any of you were born. <laughs> <laughs> well, like... Three old school friends, Steve Jackson, John Peake and myself, mm-hmm. met up in, in London and all had pretty boring jobs. And uh, not only were they boring, they were very badly paid. So we used to stay in a lot and play play lots of board games and we thought wouldn't it be great to somehow turn our hobby of playing games into a career how could that possibly happen so um we wrote a newsletter a fanzine called owl and weasel and we sent it out to everybody we knew in games reaching out to kind of build a community as it were back in the day albeit analog day and uh, one of those people who got hold of a copy of, of Alan Weir's, although we hadn't sent to him directly, was Gary Gygax, who just invented Dungeons & Dragons. He wrote to us and said, love your magazine, what do you think of this game? And we looked at the box, it was pretty dull, white box, well, actually it was a brown box, the first issue, and a very amateurish drawing on the front, but when you opened the lid and read through those rule books, it opened up your imagination like no other game had ever done before, and I don't think any game ever will again. Here was a role-playing game, uh, it was a designer game, kit rod and a game in itself 
um, giving rules for the dungeon master to create a world of labyrinth of passageways and populate those passageways with monsters and treasure. And all the players had to create characters through rolling dice uh, with attributes of strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution to create their alter ego, magicians, magic users, uh, heroes, clerics, and thieves, etc. And go on these fantastic journeys of the, mo of the mind through conversation. And uh, we were completely obsessed with D&D. &D. It kind of effectively changed our lives. So we ordered six copies of D&D, &D, and on the back of that huge order, we got the exclusive distribution agreement for the whole of Europe for three years. Wow. Um, because little did we know that Gary Gygax was also operating out of his flat. So we're both being role-playing businessmen about a role-playing game. It's, it's crazy because the amount of guests that we've had on the show that have said they've been influenced by D&D &D, and yeah. it's played such a big role in their kind of development with computer games. Well, clearly responsible for my career because we built Workshop on the back of D&D &D before Warhammer ever got started. We had this exclusive distribution agreement and, uh, and then we started White Dwarf magazine and Citadel Miniatures. And of course, the influence it's had today in video games and computer games is massive. I mean, what would World of Warcraft have been if it hadn't been for Dungeons and Dragons before yeah. it? And Skyrim and a whole host of, of, of games really go back to D&D to &D as its source. And all those kind of rules were initially set in the D&D &D tabletop gaming have kind of been transferred onto... Yeah, completely. But it's all under the hood, because obviously with graphics, you don't yeah. see all the number crunching that's going on behind. Well, how important was it to build a community of gamers back then? Well, clearly there was no internet at that time, um, no mobile phones. So it was really by meeting up and through newsletters and correspondence. So it was very small but we were kind of making it up as we went along. So workshop operated out of our flat for a number of months. Um, people used to arrive on the street looking for this shop. Of course, there wasn't one. We used to see them <laughs> downstairs, open up the window, looking for games workshop up here, mate. So you used to climb up the three <laughs> flights of stairs. And there was only a, a public pay phone on the ground floor. We didn't have a, even a phone, let alone mobile phone in our flat. The phone would ring and... Uh, it was obviously going to be a telephone sale for D&D. &D. We used to rush down the stairs, always too late. Our landlord was there first. He'd go, go all grumpy and hang up on them. And we understood the value of PR pretty early on. So we eventually got kicked out of that flat. And uh, John left and Steve and I went off to the States to attend Gen Con in 1976 to sign up all the fledgling games companies and meet Gary Gygax and the, and the others at, at, at TSR. And that was amazing because we came back and we ended up having to live in a van for three months because uh, we'd been kicked out of our flat, uh, had virtually no money, it was all tied up in stock. So you go to the bank manager and say, I've got a great idea, it's a role-playing game in which you kill monsters and find treasure and uh, blah, blah, blah. And he looks at you rather like a dog watching television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thinks you're completely mad. And uh, so we had to find a little office to, to rent. And uh, so we... Steve had a van, Van Morrison, and our office conveniently was, was next door to a squash club, so we parked the, the van outside the squash club, got out at 7 o'clock in the morning for a shave, a shower, etc., and got really good at squash by default, and into our little office. It was really the size of a bread bin. When a customer came in, one of us had to go out because there wasn't enough space. No way. <laughs> and uh, that funny got a bit tiresome, so we opened our very first retail shop in Hammersmith in 1978, and there was a huge queue there, and the community really started to build around the shops, and that's one of the things I think that still exists today, getting back to your original question, is that rather than hire traditional retailers from Marks and Spencers and the like, who knew how to sell but didn't know <clears throat> what role-playing games and, and hobby games were all about, we hired... Uh, games players, and they might have looked like Visigoths, but they were so passionate about the games uh, in the same way that we were that they you know, tell kids how to, not only how to learn the rules, but how to paint the miniatures and you know, what they should be looking for and how to expand and all the peripheral items that go with the role-playing game. So they were hugely influential and, and, and ended up selling loads of stuff because of their passion. So... We'd like to think that we built up a kind of games workshop experience um, rather than just being a sort of place where you came in and bought something and walked out. Do you remember that opening day still? Yeah, yeah. I've got a photo of it. I've been trying to uh, 
to to meet people who are in the queue. I've got a photo of the, it was April 1978, and I've met like three people now. We're going to try and do an Abbey Road reunion shot one day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All in probably in wheelchairs or something. <laughs> well, I think maybe back in the days, people must have kind of thought that they were unique with their interest in fantasy and story stuff. And then, you know, Games Workshop comes out, there's White Dwarf magazine yeah. as well, and there's a regular kind of thing coming in. Yeah, well, Wide Dwarf we started in, in uh, June 77 because obviously Owl and Weasel had run its course. It was an instant print fanzine and you know, the hobby was growing, all but mainly through word of mouth, which of course is the best um, viral spread you could possibly hope to have. And uh, everyone was hearing about this incredible role-playing game. So it spread through universities uh, and through small you know, games clubs. They were small and a few retailers. But one of the main reasons why I opened our own shops is because retailers were struggling to understand how to sell a, a game that wasn't actually a game. It was a designer game kit and all this stuff that you needed to make it an experience, you know, from miniatures to paints to figures to rule books and supplements. So you know, that's, that's what drove the retail expansion. It was quite hard selling to those shops then. They, yeah, they, didn't they just get didn't get it. Yeah. So obviously you produced um, the first interactive game books as well. Um, yeah. Where did that idea come from and did anyone kind of dismiss that at the time? Well, we've been selling D&D from 75 to 78, playing it you know, obsessively ourselves. Um, and we wanted to try and take role-playing to a much wider audience because D&D was still quite a struggle for some people to get their heads around. So we wanted to kind of get a gateway entry point for, for role-playing. And Steve and I talked about this endlessly, and we came up with this idea about interacting through a book. And we ran a, a games day in 1980 in London, and uh, there was an editor from Penguin Books who attended and was fascinated by, you know, 5,000 people obsessing over D&D and, and other role-playing games. And, and she said to us, this is amazing. Would you like to write a book about this hobby that I see before me? And we said, well, rather writing a book about the hobby, why don't you let's just write a book that gives you an experience of the hobby, I, a basic role-playing experience? And she thought that was a great idea. So we sent in our synopsis. Um, she took it to the MD of Penguin Books, who apparently laughed it out of court, said this is preposterous. No one would want to have an interactive book. That's just a you know, crazy idea. So it took a year of her... Yeah, you know, brilliance in, in in believing in in the concept. Geraldine Cook was her name, and finally, this synopsis, which was called "The Magic Quest," was published as "The Warlock of Fire Top Mountain," the very first Fighting Fantasy game book, which came out in 1982, and it, that really spread through chat on the playground, just a few pockets of schools up and down the country, and then suddenly it became a huge craze. And um, Fighting Fantasy game books ended up selling 20 million copies. But during the early days. Um, it was just extraordinary how the, the the establishment just didn't get it. For example, the Evangelical Alliance published an eight-page warning guide about fighting fantasy, saying that because uh, you're interacting with ghouls and demons, uh, clearly you're going to get possessed by the devil. <laughs> a, a woman in deepest suburbia apparently phoned her local radio station and said that having read one of my books, her son levitated. So the kids were thinking, oh, one pound fifty? I can fly, really? That's a, yeah, bargain. Great. If anything, it makes you want to buy it more, doesn't it, yeah. hearing those stories? The local vicar <laughs> promised to uh, chain himself to the railings of Penguin Books until they were banned. There were petitions, uh, people, groups asking him to burn the books. Meanwhile, all the kids were thinking, this is uber cool. And the reason they were so worried, I mean, there was even articles saying, danger, children are using their imaginations to a dangerous degree. I mean, I'm sure the idea is for children to use their imaginations. Yeah. And they were getting a whole bunch of kids reading who had never enjoyed reading before, reluctant readers. And over time, it was proven that Finding Fantasy Game Books improved literacy by 17% because it was empowering. These are books in which you, the reader, are the hero, an interactive adventure where you make a choice at the end of every page. So it was branching narrative with a gain system attached to it. So every decision point, you might meet a monster and you roll dice to see whether or not you defeat that monster. So there's many, many ways of going through the book, but only one absolute correct way of doing so. 
But um, yeah, it was extraordinary that most of the press at the time was negative. But that's always been the case about the games industry. So game book, people think it's trivial because it's got the word game in it, even though children were reading, which surely is the point. And it's actually the anniversary at the moment. It is. It's the 35th anniversary of Fighting <laughs> Fantasy. Oh, my God. That's making me really ancient, which I am. Yes, and we've got a new new publisher, uh, Scholastic, who are the largest children's book publisher in, in the world. And they've seen a, recently the uptick in the genre because those who'd read Fighting Fantasy back in the 80s have now got their own children and were saying, yeah, hey... Son, hey, daughter, I used to read these. Now, normally, kids reject out of hand anything that their parents say is cool. But it's great that they seem to like it as much as their parents did back in the day because they are interactive, they are making choices, they are empowering, and they kind of talk to Generation Z who behave like this naturally. So an, an interactive experience is a lot more interesting to them than a, a passive experience. So uh, an interactive book versus a, a, a linear book um, seems to tick their boxes. So I've written a new book to celebrate this 35th anniversary called The Port of Peril, which was uh, released quite recently, last month. Well, writing the fighting fantasy books, you must have been a tough player to fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoy... I, li- I love luring people to their doom, really, so it's... Uh, <laughs> it's like sprinkling rose petals towards quicksand. So I, I enjoy all that stuff. But you've got to make them... It's, it's quite quite difficult, actually, to write them because you're writing not only the, the, a, a path which, which brands, so you're writing multiple storylines at once, you've also got to go back in two. So if you need a key at a certain point, you have to go back in the adventure so to place the key where it can be found. And then you've got to make sure that the gameplay balances so it's not too hard, not too easy when you're fighting the monsters. And then you've got to make sure that the economy is right so that you don't find too many gold pieces or too few gold pieces to enable you to to pay your way through the points where you have to pay. So there's lots of things to balance. But, um, yeah, it's, I really enjoy doing it. I think they've got a kind of timeless quality as well. Um, fantasy books, especially with, like, you know, being set in very different worlds. My dad would read The Hobbit, and I read The Hobbit when I was a kid. And hopefully my son would read The Hobbit, you know. <laughs> it's it's kind of a timeless, eternal thing with fantasy books, I think. Well, The Hobbit and all Tolkien's work is you know, instrumental in, in many of us enjoying uh, fantasy worlds because they, they didn't, they weren't patronised and they weren't, um, you know, they weren't pretending that it's just little sweet goblins running around fairies and stuff. It was, you know, it's quite realistic and, and gruesome in many ways, but it really kind of, kicked off your imagination and that's what we try to do with the art of fighting fantasy game books we used uh, games workshop artists for the covers now puffin uh, were the publishers uh, the imprint under the penguin books as, as publisher and the editors were worried that uh, the, about the the readers they wanted to have covers that were very safe you know big toadstool with little gnome sitting on top and butterflies fluttering around and we wanted you know covers that threatened to kind of bite the faces off the readers <laughs> so we used our workshop artists um people like ian mckay who did death up dungeon for me forest of doom city of thebes and uh you know he, he was an extraordinary artist and he went actually on to to create darth maul for for george lucas so you know we used some of the best artists around at the time and their sort of attention to detail the the fact that these creatures kind of leapt out of the covers towards the reader were kind of quite instrumental, I think, in attracting readers in the first place to want to read the books. Well, obviously, when the late 70s came around, we started to see the growth of personal computers. Yeah. Did you look at them and think this would be a good platform for your adventures? Well, I just thought it was a great platform full stop. Uh, as a games creator, it doesn't you're kind of platform agnostic. You don't care whether it's analogue or digital, as long as you can get your storytelling and your gameplay out to far and wide. So we saw it as a, as a great opportunity, not particularly for Final Fantasy at the time, because obviously in the late 70s, the graphics were completely limited. So you could have text adventures, of course, um, and Penguin Books actually converted some of our books into text adventures, um, on, which are available on tape, Spectrum and uh, Commodore. But um, they were you know, fairly basic uh, I didn't really get entered into video games on a, in a career point of view until um, the mid-80s. Um, <clears throat> it's when Desktop Dungeon was 
number one of the best sellers chart, a startup company called Domark approached me and said, would I design their launch product, which is called Eureka? And we had it programmed in Hungary for secrecy because there was a 25 grand prize attached to the first person to find this number through playing the game, which is actually a phone number in a solicitor's office. Um, and so, you know, I really saw the coming of video games and uh, I ended up joining Domart when I sold out of workshop in 1991 and, and Domart became IDOS and of course IDOS, we launched uh, Lara Croft Tomb Raider in yeah. the mid-90s. Well, how was the process of going from analogue to digital then? Was there anything that you, any challenges you found or anything that was better or worse? Um, frustrating, I think, for me, because I can't code. Um, you know, I can design, I can conceptualise, I can write stories, but I can't... You know, I'm not an artist and I'm not a coder, so you realise that you're just one of the team, which is a good thing, but it's you don't know always the parameters of what's possible and what's not possible, so you're always having to ask the software engineers or ask the digital artists... Can this be done? Can that be done? And how does that relate? And it's trying to understand uh, con concepts that, which are f unfamiliar. But it's it's great to be part of a team. And you've seen now the size of teams, games like you know, Grand Theft Auto Five, you know, with hundreds of people working on it. So you're making these wonderful cinematic experiences like a Hollywood blockbuster. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, extraordinary uh, interactive experiences. But also, video games speaks to the, the general public as well through through the App Store. And a lot of people are intimidated by games controllers, and yet with the swipe of a finger across a screen, anyone could be a games player. So I think Apple are, have really expanded the market, not replaced the market, I think it's been additive, but a whole new you know, generation of people, and, and young and old, male and female, are now enjoying the delights of, of playing games on their smartphones. Well, in those early days as well, there was um, a lot of kind of interactive text adventures, games like Scott, by Scott Adams, Adventureland, yeah. and there was uh, Muds as well. Yeah. Did, did you get involved with Yeah, I did. I went to Essex University with uh, Richard Barton and oh, wow. uh, played Mud and back in the day. Oh, nice. And it was fantastic. It was kind of a bit weird. But again, it's a bit outside of my comfort zone because it's playing on a big computer. And I usually am a little analog guy who writes his books by hand on with a pen and ink. But uh, yeah, he was, you know, he did incredible stuff and it's not always been recognized. And that's a great shame because he was a, yeah, that, that could have been, of course, World of Warcraft if he'd mm. taken it to the next level. Yeah, totally. We've had him on the show, and he's yeah. just fantastic stories about yeah. those days as well. So. Well, he's a you know a great not only a great computer scientist, but he understands the importance of artificial intelligence to have behaviour that's logical and rather than just random stuff. Of some of those early adventure games that you have to do frustratingly, you know, stand on your head and whistle Dixie and open the fifth key on the on a lock, which is uh, underneath the underneath the cat to open the door. You know, it's just no sense in it, but. You know, a lot of those things, games, early adventure games on the early computers were frustratingly stupid. Well, moving on a few years, I mean, you mentioned that you had an Amiga as well. I mean, what games were you playing? Did you get much time to play around that point? Yeah, I played loads. Now you're going to test my memory. Good, but games like Defender of the Crown, I can still kind of remember the theme music. I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Impressive <laughs> graphics on that as well, though, wasn't it? Is yeah, it, that it was, was like, good. You'd never seen anything like that before. And games like Megalomania and uh, was it Cannon Fodder? And yeah. Yeah, those are the kind of games I like, which kind of reflect the board games I like. I mean, I've got over a thousand board games at home, so yeah, I like strategy games. And um, yeah, there's, the Amiga was a fantastic machine. Well, how was Lara born then? Lara, the lovely Lara. Well, a lot of people have claimed to have created Lara Croft, but it was in fact Toby Gard, who was uh, an artist at Core Design. Now, when I joined uh, Domark, um, that was in 93. It, it metamorphosed into IDOS when we floated four companies on the on the London Stock Exchange. But IDOS was still a very small company. This was October 95. And um, we'd seen also listed on the Stock Exchange was a company called Centre Gold. And Centre Gold owned a studio called Core Design. And when we made a bid for it, it was my job to go around all the studios and take a look at what they had in development. And on this, it was a, 
early March or late February, I can't remember, 96, and it was snowing, and I was in Birmingham. I'd just been to see one studio, and I thought, now, am I going to drive over to Derby, and it's snowing? I thought, should I go back to London? So anyway, I went over, and... Uh, I was greeted by Jeremy Heath Smith, who was the MD of Core Design, and he showed me around the studio, saw all these games. In the very last room, um, the screen had, I guess you could say, kind of cornerly, love at first sight. There's this incredible character on screen uh, who was Laura Croft. And not only was it a, a great character, it was also a fantastic game. There were great graphics, you know, a 3D character in a 3D world, one of the very first to do that. Um, incredible technology you know, with you know, being able to navigate not just into the screen but you can climb and you had this fantastic camera that followed and the control was brilliant. And kind of all the planets were aligned to make it a super hit. Not that we knew that at the time. I think we only put about 100,000 in the budget when we launched in November 96 and went on to sell 7 million copies of the first Tomb Raider. But getting back to who, who created Laurie, it was Toby who'd seen uh, he'd been tasked to write a, a to create a character to replace um, a character called Rick Dangerous, who was the central character of, a, of the game of the same name, which was a kind of a tomb raiding game. But Rick had a kind of a look not dissimilar to a to a, a notable film film star who had a hat and a whip and yeah. carried a back sack, <laughs> and we thought that wouldn't be very good in this new public. Uh, Public world of of the stock exchange and uh, and the, the the whole industry growing up to carry on with that character. So he was tasked to create this new character, and everyone thought he was going to do another male character. But he'd seen the rise of girl power and then a cherry tank girl, and was aware that the 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 players of of the coming consoles, the PlayStation and and Sega Saturn, and um, were going to be kind of young males, and thought. His destroying, and it was this wow. I thought it's a girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's run with that. And um, Core Design did. And by the time we we bought the Core Design, it was you know, nearly finished in development. So, you know, the team had done an incredible job, and uh, the rest of the say is history. Well, I know Toby was a massive fan of the um, Sega system at the time, and it initially came out on the Saturn, Saturn didn't yeah. it? Yeah. But it found huge success on the PlayStation later on. Well, Sony's realised what an incredible game it was and, uh, should we say, made it worth its while to be exclusive on their platform. Yeah. And uh, So we're kind of searching for a mascot yeah. at the time as well, weren't well, we? Well, you know, hardware doesn't sell itself. Software sells hardware. And so it was really Tomb Raider and Wipeout were attributable to the early success of the first PlayStation well, Laura obviously became a pin-up, really, didn't she, I guess, in, in the mid-90s? Yeah, well, it was the 90s, wasn't it? And uh, things were different then. Near, now she's a lot more realistic-looking. And uh, Well, Toby had drawn, you know, had uh, sort of rather large polygons on her. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, things were accentuated. And then we, of course, had models who were Laura for the year because we needed... Um, obviously, Lara Croft's a virtual character, but people wanted to, to appear in, in the press, to open stores, to be at press events, trade shows. So we had a different Lara Croft every every year for until about five years ago, and no longer. Well, it's kind of a mix of action, puzzle, and mystery. Yeah. How balanced was that in the original game compared to the version that came out? Did you have to make any changes or? We didn't have too much input on the first one. Um, most of the credit has to go to the, the, the team itself, and they just had to combine and say this technology and this graphics, but they also understood the three pillars of the of the franchise was this exploration, um, combat, and puzzle solving. And I think that worked well in, in the balance that they had. Well, obviously, Lara became a movie star. Yes. Did you ever visit the film sets and have much to do with it? I did meet Angelina Jolie a couple of times. I'm still kind of recovering from that. Yeah. <laughs> not only was she was incredibly beautiful, but she was also a you know, wonderfully nice person and super intelligent and, and knowledgeable. So we went to uh, see her at Greenwich College when she was doing a, a scene there. And we also 
went to um, Pinewood to see her doing... It was the bit where she was running across the Chinese terracotta soldiers and uh, I, th I guess you say I was totally disarmed. I even forgot to get the photograph after, the, <laughs> after meeting her. So, no, it was great. She, she really was perfect for the franchise. I mean, she did all her own stunts mainly. Um, you know, she was just extraordinary to work with. What do you think of the recent Tomb Raider games? I think Crystal Dynamics have done an amazing job. I mean, Core Design had done a wonderful job in iterating every year a, a new game, which is huge pressure to come out with a new game because, you know, we were kind of driving that because the, the fans wanted it, clearly the stock market and shareholders wanted it, and they did an incredible job. But it came to a point um, with PlayStation 2 that things went a little awry. Uh, Angel of Darkness was not the game it should have been. Um, the first five games were brilliant uh, for me, especially two and three, but uh, Angel of Darkness, it, they kind of ignored what the fans were saying rather than being running around tombs. She was suddenly in the streets of Paris and Prague. The control and the camera were not up to scratch. Um, there was a lot of, you know, some bugs in there. And unfortunately, Core were not able to make the step up from PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2. There had been a, a bottleneck in the, in the tech progression. And uh, it was a very, very tough decision, but inevitably the right decision to move the development from core design to our company-owned studio in California, which is Crystal Design, because they had an engine and, uh, and a team there that were more than able to carry on uh, doing it. And I think history has proven that it was the right decision, because what Crystal have done has been extraordinary. Yeah, well, the motion capture and yeah. just the feel of the game is just fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's Incredibly, you know, a bit of a corny word these days, immersive, but it absolutely is immersive. It's kept that kind of movie style that yeah. the, the initial ones had as well. Yeah. You know. I think as well you made an interesting point there, you know, when you went from the PS1 to the PS2, we kind of forget just how big the leaps were in technology around, yeah. you know, those 10 years. And I guess, you know, the, the more advanced consoles got, the bigger the games had to be and the more people that you needed to work on them. Yeah, from the initial team of six for... For the first Tomb Raider now to yeah, probably over 100 people working on Tomb Raider these days. Yeah, crazy. So how was the Tomb Raider anniversary? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I seem to be around a lot of anniversaries these days. <laughs> the 35th of anniversary, 40th of Final Fantasy, 40th anniversary of White Dwarf and, and Workshop and the 20th anniversary of Tomb Raider. Yeah, it was, it was good, although I wasn't involved in it too much. I contributed to the anniversary book quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just kind of exciting. You just can't believe that 20 years is gone. It's just, how did that happen? <laughs> the blink were, of an eye. <laughs> were you involved or did you attend the um, Tomb Raider in concert events that happened in London? No, I, I couldn't go, unfortunately. I was away, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I heard it was pretty, pretty special. So do you think play something... We kind of forget as an adult, you know, you forget how to play and imagine. There's a, there's a tendency for children, to, uh, for adults to think, well, I'm, I'm a grown-up now, I shouldn't be playing. And yeah, I think play helps define us as who we are as human beings. Not only is it entertaining, I think play is also educational. I mean, people always say, oh, these games should be banned, you know, they're poisoning children's minds. But if you park your prejudice against one or two titles which children shouldn't be playing anyway because they're 18 rated, but just forget about that for a second and think cognitively what's happening when people are playing games, children in particular. They're problem solving. You can't get through a game without problem solving. You're learning intuitively. You can fail in a safe environment. You're not punished for making mistakes. In fact, you're encouraged to try again because you're rewarded for being right. So you can play through a game in multiple ways. It's not either right or wrong, where education is very binary. You either, that's right or that's wrong. And exams reflect that sort of binary decision. And games are very creative. Games like Minecraft, where you're building these wonderful 3D architectural worlds, sharing with the, your friends. I mean, who wouldn't want to become an architect after playing uh, Minecraft? And games simulate real-world environments, and I think education should reflect the world around us. So if you're playing a game, any simulation game, let's take Rollercoaster Tycoon, where you're building a theme park, you're understanding the physics of building the, the, 
the rides, um, the economy of of pricing those rides, the the staffing levels. Uh, this is a management simulation. It kind of it's a, a multidisciplinary management simulation. I mean, what's not to like about that? It contextualizes learning, and you know, we we accept simulations if it's not a game. You know, when would you rather your pilot? Learn to fly by reading a book or using simulation software. For me, hello, I know that's uh, yeah. <laughs> simulation software. It's a game without the scoring. Mm. So let's think more positively about games. They can really help children enjoy learning, and that's the thing that's missing from learning in schools a lot of the time. In secondary, in particular, is the enjoyment of of learning. So games based learning and problem solving, I think, should be in every curriculum. Well, I think as well. You know, interestingly. Probably Lara Croft and the PlayStation had a lot to do with making games more acceptable to like teenagers and people in the twenties. Before that, you know, like Super Nintendo and Mega Drive seemed a bit more like it was aimed at the preteen kind of market. Yeah. Well, I just hope that again. That's why I was so pleased at the success of the App Store and Google Play is that uh, people who never thought for one second they could play a game are now able to, and hopefully, even if they're playing a very simple game, they might migrate onto into games that are more challenging. In the same way that Fighting Fantasy is a gateway to reading. If you start kids off with Shakespeare, chances are you're going to turn them off reading for life. If you start them off with Fighting Fantasy or a comic, get them to enjoy the, the, the experience, then when they're ready, they'll get onto these great works of art and literature. Yeah, there's so many people that are like, oh, do you play computer games? No, but I play, you know, Fruit Ninja on my phone. <laughs> I don't something. know the game, but they are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kind of like the casual gamers are the gateway. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Um, have you seen a recent revival in the kind of interest in gaming generally? Yeah, definitely. Especially uh, board games. Mm. Uh, I think who'd have thought that you know, board games would come back? But um, they are because, well, mainly I think for because of, of uh, crowdfunding and Kickstarter in particular. Um, retail sh shops had, had kind of not died a death. Obviously, there were special shops like Games Workshop selling Warhammer to devoted fans around the world and doing that brilliant job doing that. But for general games, retail outlets were in, in huge decline. But there were still games players out there. And therefore, through crowdfunding, they didn't have to be all in the same location. You could sell your game to people around the world and it's effectively pre-marketing in the world telling you whether or not your idea is any good. So you get it funded, and therefore there's no risk because a lot of people who self-publish games end up with a garage of 5,000 games and selling 10. But So Kickstarter has allowed the distribution and to connect gamers globally, and out of that, of course, has come a community. And with the advent of the Internet, you've got fantastic game sites, um, bespoke ones like Board Games Geek and people talking about it on YouTube like Dice Tower. So you can learn to play a game by watching all the videos on Dice Tower and other sites. So, you know, it's a lot of pain is taken away. So everyone can find a game that suits them. They can learn how to play online and off you go. Well, we were talking before we started recording about, you know, um, tabletop gaming cafes. You know, there's one here in Nottingham. You drive past it any night. It's rammed. It's yeah. like they're popping up everywhere now, aren't they? Well, it's great social fun. I've been running my own little board games club since the 1980s. I, I do a, a newsletter called... Uh, yeah, the Games Night Club newsletter. That's really dynamic uh, title, and we've had the same six people for nearly thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> Another anniversary, <laughs> and then we're on issue four hundred and seventy-two at the moment. So uh -huh. the circulation of six. So people like Peter Molyneux is in it, Steve Jackson, and uh, other people from the games industry. I, I I think it's fantastic that there's this kind of tabletop gaming revival because when I was a kid, the only place I could go was Games Workshop to actually play it or Laser Quest where there'd be a few kids playing Magic the Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> like now, there's full communities and nearly every city yeah. has probably got a tabletop gaming place. Well, I think it's the social social fun of playing games. Yeah, I like uh, having the sort of smiling assassin approach to games and. Uh... Being able to stab your mates in the back, having thought they'd done a great deal. <laughs> I was looking brilliant in the fun. eye. Yeah. <laughs> Tear rolling down the cheek. <laughs> well, do you ever visit Games Workshop, Sam, when you're in town? Do you ever just pop in and. They want to head office here? Yeah. Or just like any on a high street? I'm you... still in contact with, with, with the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I talked to the CEO recently and, and others and uh, goes to Games Days when, when they're on, but I think there well, hasn't been one for a year or so. Mm. But I, I always pop in the shop and have a look around 
everything is becoming more and more focused on Warhammer now. Even the the shops are being called Warhammer shops now. Mm. So clearly, the Games Workshop is just the the holding company, but the brand is very much Warhammer. Well, it's fantastic that you've been recognised with a OBE, CBE, and BAFTA as well. When you were living in that van, <laughs> <laughs> did you ever imagine? <laughs> No, we were just living the dream. You know, we were games players and trying to eke a living out of making games. And, uh, you know, I've enjoyed every minute. I mean, I mean, you're never too young to start playing games. I don't think you're ever too old to stop. And what I'd say, what I try and do is, whenever possible, is try and share the positives around the industry. You know, it's a fantastic industry. The people in it are wonderful. It's not ego-driven like lots of industries because there's no celebrity in the games industry. It's all, it's all about the games themselves. And so the people working it are great, uh, and and games is a is a is a wonderful experience. I say it's we learn through play. When we're born in this into this world, we interact with it. Um, that's how we how we learn, and we never stop learning through play. It's just that we seem to think that play is trivial when you get to a certain age. It absolutely isn't. Well, tell us about your current book, Port of Peril. Yes. Well, that's. Uh, I had to go back to digging out my old uh, analog components, so I, I do it old school. So, Port of Peril is um, a return to Alancia. This is the world of fighting fantasy. So you start off on this on this journey, thinking you're going on a treasure quest, and you soon realise that that's not the reason why you're you're wandering around Alancia, and uh, you find out there's a there's a return of an old adversary. It's a reincarnation of this this night prince into a sort of big demon character called uh, Zambal Bone, who was the the baddie in, in City of Thieves. So you've got to kind of wander around and find the right stuff to defeat him. But writing it was a lot of fun. You know, to, to create a branching narrative is is challenging, but definitely worth the while. So Port of Peril is celebrating the 35th anniversary of, of Fighting Fantasy. Hopefully it's going to do well, but um, this is not the 80s. There's a lot of other things competing with interactive books these days, and not least of which are video games. But... Uh, it's, I'm pleased to see that you know, so far so good. It has got into the uh, wander into Smiths all the time, you know, like a scared person saying, is it on the shelves? Oh, it's number 17 in the charts, <laughs> happy. Well, Ian, it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, it's been just, this trip down memory lane's always amazing and just getting yeah. some new stories. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. The two major things you've influenced in my life, Games Workshop and Lara Croft. <laughs> like my obsessions of youth. <laughs> okay, long may it continue. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.